Morning everyone, we'll be uh, starting in five minutes. It's chilly. One more minute to go and then we'll start because it is cold. <clears throat> Good morning everyone, it is 10 o'clock and we are live. Um, the temperature this morning is cold. I reckon it is about minus one still here in Leicestershire, so I've got my mitts on. And today is all about how to sleep outdoors if it's really cold. And the Scouts have had this ongoing brass monkey challenge um, over the last few years, um, which is all about getting outdoors and sleeping outdoors, whether it be in a natural bivouac type structure, um, a, a shelter made out of stuff, or whether it be under a tarpaulin. Um, it's just getting outside and sleeping next to nature. So I hope everyone is well this morning. There isn't really a join in live, but hopefully there's tons of 
useful, factual content that you'll be able to take away with you and potentially sleep outdoors, even if there's snow on the ground like there is at the moment here in England. I'm just going to do a few shout outs to everyone who's tuned in. Lots of the regulars back. Um, um, Almet says, hello, Ed and Stephen. Hello, Almet. Um, Steve Walton says, morning, Ed. Looking forward to your next episode from Cheltenham. Big up to everyone in Cheltenham. The Rudler says, morning, all. Hi, Ed and Stephen from Amet, who's just already said that. Um, <laughs> right, Amet, stop saying hi, Ed and Stephen, because that's the third time I've tried to read your comments out. <laughs> but I suppose it does give you a better chance of being read out, doesn't it? But don't everyone do that. Um, Paru Ram says hi again from Malaysia. Thank you for tuning back in again, Paru. Good to see you. Good morning from Gary and Amanda. That's um, Gary Seville. Jez says morning from Theo in Newark. Morning, Theo. How are you doing, mate? Um, <clears throat> Peter Ward said, uh, sorry to miss you on Wednesday. We love what you're doing. Um, Peter and Primrose in Norfolk, that is. So hi, guys. Thank you for, Bush, uh, for tuning in again. For the youth says, hi, Ed. Good morning to you guys. Uh, um, Luciano says, um, good morning from Brazil. Buongiorno. No, that's Italian. <laughs> um, oh, my God. Bonjour. Um, Borgia, I can't even remember. I used to be able to speak Portuguese. Crikey. Um, Isaac says, what's the weather like for you now, Ed? Well, do you know what, Isaac? My wife and I took our little boy when he was eight weeks old and we decided to do a trip in our Land Rover around Norfolk. And we drove, um, we got the ferry across to um, Holland, uh, the Netherlands, and then we drove up and went through Sweden. And then we got the, we got the ferry from Stockholm over to Tallinn, Estonia. And um, we drove off, the, uh, drove off the ferry in my Land Rover and I went, it's Baltic. And <laughs> it is Baltic this morning, absolutely Baltic. So it's a very, very appropriate, um, very appropriate morning to be doing how to sleep outdoors or how to keep yourself warm if you do want to sleep outdoors. Um, I am sitting in front of um, the same basher that I put up on Wednesday in multiple configuration, but actually a, a new configuration. We've only got, you can only see half of the, the tarpaulin side here. The other half is actually underneath me. Um, it's underneath this bit of cardboard that I've got down here. And that's so that if you are sleeping in this sort of configuration, the damp doesn't come up through. And that is quite a big configuration. But a big thing to think about when you are um, sleeping outdoors is damp. If you get damp, you get cold. You want to make sure wherever you position yourself, you can stay dry. I think that is probably the most important thing. You can go down to really quite low temperatures and be absolutely fine if you're dry. So I would say um, I did 60 days sleeping on the streets um, for a Channel 4 project um, year before last. And um, that included um, two weeks of sleeping on the streets up in Glasgow in February. And uh, I bet anyone who's tuning in from Glasgow will verify that in February it's pretty cold on the streets in Glasgow. Um, but we did it. And we did it, we're using a number of things. And the main thing was sleeping in doorways that were recessed from the road and that had an overhanging top on them. You can't just sleep anywhere. You can't, even if you've got cardboard, you can't sleep in the middle of the street because you get run over by a car. No, you can't sleep in the pavement, even if you've got cardboard, because if it rains in the night and you get wet, that cardboard's gonna lose all its insulating properties. Water is a brilliant conductor of um, heat and we don't want that, okay? We want insulating things and not conductors. So, um, I'm gonna go through a few things that potentially you could put underneath you. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I've just mentioned is, this tarpauling is in, a, is in an L shape, and, and so although I do want cover from the elements on top, I've done it so that um, it's also got cover from the damp coming up. I've also got cardboard here. Can you, I don't know if you can see this. I've just unfolded a big cardboard box and put it out. Now, a lot of homeless people you will see um, use cardboard. Um, not as many people um, I saw on the streets were using it in, um, I suppose, what a stereotypical um, homeless shelter looks like, which is actually using the rigidity and the, and the actual form of the cardboard boxes and crawling inside it. I've not seen that done much, although that does provide an incredibly warm um, enclosed space. I've done it myself just once in Glasgow when it was actually snowing. And if you join multiple cardboard boxes together and get inside, the space inside, just with your own body temperature, gets really, really warm. So cardboard on the ground is a brilliant, brilliant thing. This is... Um, this isn't a fancy insulated mat at all. This is just out of, um, we get some of our food delivered um, 
in with ice packs and uh, this is what came inside the um, it came inside the cardboard box and it's actually it's got um, these little what do you call this uh, bubble wrap it's got bubble wrap inside it and it's got um, foil on it and this is one of the best insulators possible so if I was again rummaging through a bin and trying to do this on the streets I would definitely look to see if I could get any of this insulated bubble wrap that would be an amazing find and it's obviously brilliant for me on my knees at the moment so cardboard bubble wrap um, if you are however indoors or and you're uh, planning to do this in your garden the most obvious um, choice might be a closed cell uh, mat like this and again I did make sure I got my hands on one of these when I was on the streets because because these are extraordinarily insulating um, I'm going to unroll it and put it all down but um, the only negative I would say about these is they're a little bit um, they're a little bit bulky if you're carrying it and you're putting it on your rucksack then um, it could be deemed to be a little bit bulky but that is probably going to keep you warmer it's certainly going to keep you warmer than multiple layers of cardboard from experience and so if you've got one I would say that's a really good idea even if you've got one of these now um, <clears throat> this is a um, this is an inflatable um, sleeping mat now you don't have to have one of these um, this is definitely not me saying go and buy an inflatable sleeping mat but a lot of people in my industry now a lot of people who work in TV a lot of people doing expeditions um, do prefer these mats and you can see how small they got I mean that was not much bigger than my coffee cup um, and incredibly light and they provide you with a bed which is which is super comfy what I would say about these even though they do insulated versions that have got a bit of down in they're not as warm as a closed cell mat they're more expensive by far closed cell mat if you've got um, if you've got a limited budget or if it's really cold it's not quite as comfy but I would always go for it because it's more insulated but I'm going to demonstrate this and, and how quickly actually it does blow up so I can't speak while I'm doing this obviously That didn't take long really did it um, and these even have a, 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 a two-way valve there so that it won't let air out while you're blowing it up you just don't do a different valve to to um, and that is you, that is a um, cushioned mattress it's an utter luxury quite frankly it used to be a company called Thermarest that did the best ones I don't believe that's the case anymore this one's Cedar Summit again I'm not advocating any particular brand I'm not sponsored by them but um, these ones are particularly small and I, 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 I do use them um, so that then um, often we would do we used to put our expeditions in um, in Patagonia um, and uh, we used to cross the northern ice cap in Chilean Patagonia and um, we used to take volunteers again so uh, young adults on gap year trips and it, we would always recommend a combination of the two so they would carry with them something that <coughs> actually look very like this um, which inside it and they carry this on the outside of their pack inside it they would have both a closed cell mat and a old school thermarest type thing and this is how big they used to be actually this is worth getting out I just dug this out of the attic but um, this is what I used to use and look look how big that is compared to the um, the one that I just got out of that bag that's how much they've shrank down in recent years if you being stingy and you're a scout leader and you've you've still got one this big then you know it might be time to uh, to break out a new one. Oh, and then there's an alternative to the closed cell mats which is um which is this Zed, Zed rest again that's made by Thermarest company that I've mentioned a few times that I don't actually <laughs> don't actually like that much um <clears throat> but it's just an alternative I don't really know um why that is better than a normal closed cell mat um I I find it a bit more awkward. I find in the night it scrumples up a little bit more, but you know, everyone's got their own personal choices in life, haven't they? Okay, so I think that covers um, underneath from a, um, I suppose from a man-made perspective, we've got cardboard, we've got insulated boxing, 
we've got closed cell thermorest and we've got we've got a closed cell mat and we've got an inflatable mat. And um, what I would say is if if you're doing this and you're trying to be purist bushcraft, um, then there are still ways to insulate yourself from the ground. Um, first thing is to get off the ground. And now if you're if you're literally sleeping on the ground, that's the quickest way because it's damp on the ground as well to lose all your energy or lose it straight down into the ground. So you don't want that at all. You want to elevate yourself a little bit. Now, the main easiest way of doing that is um, by putting logs down underneath you. You'll make yourself a bed, basically. You'll make yourself, ideally, <coughs> a bed that fits under a uh, lean-to shelter. And a lean-to is the most classic bushcraft shelter. There's loads of videos. I've done some videos on how to make a lean-to shelter, but there's loads of videos on YouTube of how to make a lean-to shelter. And the reason we've got that shelter, one, to protect you from the um, elements, two, to reflect the heat of the fire back, but three, so that it's big enough to put a bed inside as well. So you want to put a raised bed, which is a wooden bed, and then you want to think about, okay, what is it that I need to trap underneath me, between the, me and the bed, in order to stay warm? And that, of course, is air. You want to trap air. So whether that's spruce um, uh, um, <coughs> uh, branches, or just anything that's voluminous, basically. If you're taking the tips off spruce branches, and you put them um, um, so that the hard bits are on the outside and then the soft bits are in the middle, it's actually surprisingly comfy. And the more you build up, the more comfy it gets and the more air between you and the bed and the warmer you stay. Um, I suppose one last note on that, because I'm talking about natural outdoor shelters, is um, <clears throat> if you look at this, what's, what's the deliberate um, mistake? I, in fact, if, you've, if, you've, uh, if, if you are actually, um, if you've got an answer to that, that would be great. Tell me what the deliberate mistake is with this fire. I'm, I'm giving it away really, aren't I now? This fire and this setup. I, in an ideal world, you wouldn't mix thin synthetic sort of bashes and stuff and fires. Um, this could easily have slightly wet wood, it could spit, um, and you'll, get, you'll end up getting holes in both your sleeping bags and your ponchos, okay? So although I've set this up this morning to be nice and atmospheric with a fire going and a synthetic basher behind me, I would make a point that um, you kind of go down one route or another. Um, if you're gonna sleep outside and you're gonna try and stay warm in a nice lean-to shelter and you're gonna stay warm using the fire, then you won't be using a fire bowl anyway. You'll be using a long fire. Um, and a long fire is literally, again, I've done videos um, of this on our, on our um, online bushcraft site, but a long fire is a really, really good way of uh, keeping you warm, plenty warm enough to sleep outdoors at temperatures like minus 20, minus 30. And you wouldn't think that was possible, but it is. Um, <clears throat> but you wouldn't necessarily want to mix that. I've put so many holes in my uh, sleeping bags over the years from breaking that rule. But I, as this is an instructional thing aimed at families and kids, I would say, look, you're asking for trouble if you're spending a lot of money on your sleeping bag or your basher, and then you're putting it next to a fire which potentially could spit. Um, it's one or the other. But if you have got, or if you're taking with you this sort of this sort of clobber, you should be able to stay warm without a fire at night. Um, okay, are there any shout outs or questions at this stage? Um, um, um. Do, do, do. Um. We've got a question which is, where can I get a good hammock with a mosquito net for the jungle? Is the one you used in the Amazon or into the unknown? No. Um, again, not sponsored by anyone, but um, Hennessy, I think, make a really good all-in-one hammock. Um, DD hammocks um, make a British equivalent. Got to admit, I don't like it as much. I think it's a poor man's Hennessy, um, which is... Um, which is not going to please them as a company. But I mean, my wife used uh, DD hammocks on her expedition to Guyana um, to kayak the length of the Essequibo River. The whole team used them. They work really well. I'm not saying they're bad, but uh, again, everyone has preferences, um, don't they? Um, I actually used a hybrid um, hammock and mosquito net in the, in the Amazon um, that I had made up by a seamstress. So it was wider. It had bigger, um, what I call wizard sleeves at the end for the hammock strings to go out of. And, uh, and then he, I did use a Hennessy hex fly on the top which is a massive fly where you could get six people underneath it in a rainstorm and, and you'd be happy um so i used a a, a sort of hybrid method um do 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 good morning to georgia and jamie from leeds hi guys um 
Maxine in Newark on Trent is saying morning, morning to you and everyone in Newark. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Good morning from a cold Germany. Yeah, I bet you're um, colder than us probably over there in Germany at the moment. <laughs> Gary Seville says, top tip, wear long trousers to keep you warm. Mate, I, I, my knees never get cold. <laughs> uh, Rinalds is saying hello. Kim is saying it is ready Baltic in. I'm not sure ready is a very kid friendly word, um, Kim, but ready Baltic in Glasgow this February. <laughs> um, Lola is saying I made some cordage out of dead bamboo vines I find in my garden and it was my first time. Well done, Lola, nice one. Um, I think in terms of this sort of beginner's attitude towards things, you know, I, I've never professed to be the expert at any of these things. Um, I um, often find myself in, in, in survival situations where I'm just having to make things up. But that doesn't mean that that's wrong. <laughs> you know, you're always going to be faced with situations where you've not done something before. And for me, throwing yourself into a situation that you've not done before, that's when you start growing as a person, isn't it? If you do something that you've done before 20 times, then you're not going to expand your, uh, your field of expertise. You're not going to come up with any more solutions. Doing something for the first time that scares you a little bit is so healthy, I think. As a, It's not about being an adrenaline junkie. It's not about you know, being this crazy person who wants to go and sleep outdoors. It's setting yourself a challenge that potentially is going to be a bit difficult, is going to involve an element of hardship, is going to involve you thinking about things that you've never thought about before. And therefore, that makes you a more rounded person in general. So never be afraid of doing things um, for the first time, I would say. Daniel saying greetings from Copenhagen. Thank you for tuning in, mate. That is amazing. We're getting people from all around the world. Um, good morning from the GH boys. <clears throat> Thank you for tuning in again. Uh, 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 morning from Lola and Graham and Marlow. Casper and Kate say hi. That's Mama Hutter. Uh, um, do, do, do. Kai or Kay in um, Mutsumi, Japan is saying good morning again. <clears throat> and being very complimentary about our masterclasses as well. Thank you, Kai. That's very nice of you. Um, do, do, do. Lola and Graham and Marlo. Carl is saying hi from the Hubbastees in Oban. Um, or Oban. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, Morning, everyone from Snappy Twigs Forest School. Hi, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Do, do, do. Uh, uh, um. Woodland Project at Forest in Horsham. Morning, guys. Okay, I think I've gone. I've gone back through all of the all of the highs, uh, all of the hellos. Right. So we've got ourselves our insulated layer on the floor, and that is that is a super important thing. I want to talk now a little bit about. Um, different types of ways to keep yourself warm on top. Now, you can use cardboard on top, um, but again, having done this for real, um, London, Manchester and, um, and um, Glasgow, I did the, the homeless sleeping roof um, project and it wasn't about could I sleep on the streets? Of course you could. And I've always avoided doing an urban survival situation because I thought it just took the, took the mickey out of um, people who are actually having to sleep rough for real and I, so, so I thought from a, from a um, I don't know, a flashy beating your chest survival perspective it was the wrong thing to do and then it was put to me that, that um, wouldn't it be good if you actually slept rough in order to um, tell the stories of the people who are sleeping on the streets and I, I bought into that, I thought that's a good idea and I'll get an experiential first hand understanding a little bit of it, not the desperation of course, because I could have returned to my own home whenever I wanted to, but it was um, from a physical perspective and also just a, a sort of an amazing insight into, into these guys' lives. Um, you can put cardboard on top of you, but it's, it falls off and like all the air comes in. As I explained before, you can sleep inside concentric, if you put concentric cardboard boxes inside each other and make a long tube, that does work really well. Um, a lot of homeless people um, will just put on as many coats as they can um, and obviously some people do die of the cold, it is possible, especially if, if, you've, if, um, if they've been drinking or worse, then um, it is possible. But um, ideally, you want to get hold of a sleeping bag. Now, as I, as I said at the very beginning, one of the worst things that can happen is that if you get wet, um, you're going um, <coughs> to get cold really, really, really fast. 
Um, I have got frostbite once in my life, and that was in Siberia. The temperature got down to minus 37 degrees Celsius, but I shouldn't have got frostbite. I had a tent. Um, <clears throat> my problem was though that I had leather boots on and the leather got wet. Um, and when um, I came to <laughs> get into my tent, I thought, if I take these leather boots off and leave them outside my sleeping bag, they're gonna freeze solid and in the morning I'm not gonna be able to put my boots on so I'm gonna be disabled basically. I'm not gonna be able to move, which was unacceptable. <laughs> so the right thing I did um, was to bring them inside my sleeping bag. The wrong thing that I did was to leave them on my feet inside my sleeping bag. Um, so minus 37, wet boots on my feet. Okay, they didn't freeze, but I did get a very severe frostbite and I had to have plastic surgery on my, on my toes uh, to excavate all of the invalid flesh, they called it. Um, and uh, it's now a weak point. So if I was to do an expedition to Antarctica, I've got, I've got frostbite, um, which can, which can um, have a tendency to come back. So you don't want to let yourself get wet. Um, what I should have done, of course, is to bring the boots inside the sleeping bag um, <clears throat> to stop them from freezing, but in a, in a waterproof bag um, and to keep them warm, but um, to keep them away from my body. And then, then that wouldn't have brought my own temperature down. Um, there's two types of sleeping bag, basically. the synthetic and then there is down. Um, properties of both. Obviously, well, not obviously, but I'm going to ex explain this. Synthetic is a far more um, bulky material. So if you're packing this into a bag, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to weigh more and it's going to be more bulky. But the brilliant thing about synthetic is that if it gets wet, um, you it will still retain its thermal properties. Now, um, this is what I would have used in the military, um, a, a, a olive green one, of course, because you don't want the enemy to see you, but um, you sacrifice weight and um, volume for the fact that you want to know that you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna perform even if it gets wet. Um, and I would say if you've only got one sleeping bag, in the UK, because we are such a damp climate, then a synthetic one is probably the safer option. My first few bags, when I came up through the Cubs and the Scouts and then into the military were always synthetic. It was only actually in adult life that I started using down bags. Now, I do use down bags more today. Um, one, because I like the fact that they pack down into absolutely nothing. Um, but two, because I trust myself not to get them wet. And I think you know in your heart of hearts whether you can keep something wet or whether you, you don't trust yourself and whether you need a synthetic sleeping bag. But they are the main differences. Um, I'm just gonna do a little demonstration about how small we can get this um, sleeping bag. So this one is, an, is a pretty much an Arctic sleeping bag, um, 600 fill I think, so not quite Arctic, but um, it's meant for the mountains. And I've never been an advocate of putting them into their own bags because once you've got a sleeping bag into, in its own bag, it's, it's a really awkward shape to then put into a rucksack, isn't it? So I've always been a fan of stuffing the sleeping bag into the, um, into the liner of my pack. So then it fills up, let's, let's show you this, it fills up the whole of the bottom of your rucksack, but it goes so small, you see it's only coming up to there, but it means that your, it means a number of things. So your pack is beautifully rounded at the bottom, it also means if you stop on a break and you put your rucksack down and you want to sit on something, you know there's nothing breakable at the bottom there and that you can drop your pack quite heavily on the bottom and it's actually going to be, if you've got a laptop or something further up it, it's going to be protected by your sleeping bag at the bottom. So two and a half years walking the Amazon, that was where my sleeping bag went. I, all, I just threw away the sleeping bag bag itself. You do, you will see that I've got a waterproof rucksack liner in this which is big enough, again, depends on the size of your bag, but it's big enough to fill the entire, um, entire rucksack, but then stuff that in there and um, you don't, can you imagine if, you'd, if I'd stuff that into a bag and then tried to get it into the rucksack, there's gonna be all sorts of weird knobbly bits on the outside. It's never gonna fill properly. Top tip for me is um, if you've got a sleeping bag, stuff it, stuff it straight into the bag. But obviously if it's a wet place like the Amazon, make sure you've got a waterproof rucksack liner. Okay, right, uh, do, do, do. So we've gone through insulation from the bottom, we've gone through roll mats and, and, um, and um, sleeping mats. 
We've gone through sleeping bags, synthetic and non-synthetic. Let's take some questions if there are any. <clears throat> do, do, do. So if you've got any questions on any of this um, or on any of the stuff that I've covered previously or on expedition planning or survival or bushcraft, then please bang them in the comments now and, and um, I will I'll try and answer them personally right now. Uh, could you keep a down sleeping bag in a dry bag or would that cause problems with condensation if using for multiple nights in a row? By dry bag, I think you're talking about a bivy bag. Um, bivy bags are great um, because you could, one step beyond sleeping under a tarp is sleeping in a sleeping bag that's got then, then you've got a bivy bag over it. What I would say is that um, some of the more hardcore <laughs> bivy bags, the ones that are more waterproof, breathe less and therefore unless it's really really cold and you're hanging off a mountain they can get quite sweaty inside so i i would go for a, a material like pertex um, maybe laminated pertex which has got a bit more um, uh, weather resistance but um, if it's going to rain personally i would want a basher i would want a roof over me sleeping in a bivy bag without a roof over you at all does require a level of waterproofness that i think compromises the breathability of the bag so it's a trade-off, isn't it? Um, personally, yeah, a Pertex bivy bag is a really useful thing to have. It can stop a bag getting damp, absolutely. Um, but if you are talking about that type of thing, then you, you, you're gonna be risking it if you're using a down bag because <laughs> you, you, one, you don't wanna sweat into a down bag, but two, you don't want that to be um, getting damp at all because the thermal properties of down are massively compromised if that gets wet. I hope that helps. Um, uh, uh, um. Morning from Rosie, Matt, and Pongo from a freezing Tewkesbury. Uh, 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 uh. Hi, guys. Could you do a big shout out to Oxfordshire Home Education Bushcraft Group and say as soon as we can get back in the woods, we will, I think that says. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> do, 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 even if you do get smoke in your eyes. Any more cooking over the fire? The orangey egg lesson was brilliant. Yeah, of course we'll do some more cooking over the fire. It's just finding things that are, you can cook in a short enough time to do in a half an hour lesson, but I'm sure there will be some more. I was thinking some little dough balls or stuff like that, but again, if you've got any suggestions, then do fire them in. Um, that would be cool. Uh, um, would it be possible to show us several ways to make water safe for drinking? Yeah, I would, of course. Um, yeah, we haven't done that really at all. Well, we've done a water filter, haven't we, as one of the survival hacks. But um, yeah, the, the top tip is, is, is boiling, obviously. If you can get um, water to a rolling boil, they used to say for 10 minutes, I think that's overkill. And I think it's industry standard that that's overkill. As long as you've got a rolling boil, um, you've killed all of, the, all of the, the nasties in there and then that water is safe to drink. Um, in the Amazon, I used iodine tincture, which they don't recommend anymore for um, water purification i used that for the first year and a half and then i was told that um, if you use it for more than six months you'll go sterile which i didn't really want um so i stopped taking that but luckily i've had three kids since and so it didn't have that effect so i switched over to chlorine drops which literally tasted like i was drinking a swimming pool every time which again i'm sure that because that's bleach basically isn't it i'm sure the inside of my guts is is bright white pertil white <laughs> after drinking chlorine water for the subsequent six months after that um but um, so yeah, from a bushcraft perspective, we, we did go through that natural water filter, which is quite a good one, uh, quite a classic bushcraft hack, the one in the plastic bottle. Um, and the, an, just another hack, I suppose, in terms of getting pure water is, if you're worried about getting stuff um, from a river because of contaminants, maybe a dead animal has been in the water uh, a little bit upstream and you haven't seen it, but that's got put um, nasties into the water, excavate a hole in the bank and allow the water to filter through the ground and the water will fill up in the hole that you've just excavated the new well basically that you've just dug and then if you take water out of that that'll be much safer to drink than water out of the um out of the river direct because that is um that is liable to power, to um to all sorts of infections getting in the water whereas obviously if you're filtering it through at least a meter of earth then um it is safer but I would still advocate boiling if you're at all worried about anything in terms of water. Do, do, do. Uh, uh, um. 
Moss7 is loving learning with you, Ed, and Stephen, which is ace as he won't listen to me. <laughs> That's from Kim. Hi, Moss. Morning to you, mate. Um, what regiment was you, mate? Uh, I was Devon and Dorset regiments. Um, do, do Ed loving the lives and watching with Dad. That's from Seb. Um, hi, Seb. Morning, mate. How are you? Where can I get a good fishing line with a hook yeah, you had in the Amazon? Uh, we bought all of our stuff in Brazil, actually. Um, but, I mean, it wasn't complicated stuff. You need a good chunky hook for piranhas, certainly, and you need um, and some <laughs> thick enough wire that it, uh, it's not wire, but um, nylon that it's going to work. Um, we, we used all sorts of things for weights. We used all sorts of things for floats. This uh, closed cell, th th closed cell sleeping mats work really well as, as, as improvised floats. Um, I would say if you're, if you're fishing for piranhas, you need, you need a wire leader, or if you haven't got any, um, then you need a little section of wire connecting your hook onto your nylon line, because otherwise your piranha comes along and just bites your hook off, and you're left with um, just a, a bit of nylon without a hook on the end. So you do need a, a section of wire to, to stop teeth, uh, fish with massive teeth taking your hooks. Uh, Theo asks, would it be good to put another sleeping bag inside the other? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this sleeping bag, do, 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 do. Oh, the one that I packed into the bag was made by a company, PH Designs, that make mountain wear and stuff. They actually sent me a, a trio of three sleeping bags. One's a summer weight sleeping bag, one's a mid weight sleeping bag, and one's a heavier one. And they're designed to all go inside each other. Of course, that's a nice flexible system, especially if you're going to multiple environments like I do. Uh, you know, I might be going to, on one trip, I might go to um, so, so high altitude mountains in China and then into swampland and then into desert and stuff like that. And so I need to have um, a varied um, range of bags so that I can, uh, you know, in the prep phases so that I can sleep in, um, sleep in comfort. But um, obviously one bag doesn't do everything. So that bag in a bag in a bag works really well. So that is um, a good question from Theo. I am uh, planning on walking for 24 hours on a circular walk. What advice would you give? If you're walking for 24 hours and you're not used to walking, I would say uh, make sure your boots are really comfy. I would almost go for something like trainers, if, if depending on the ground, obviously, and where you're going, if they're more comfortable, certainly than a pair of unbroken in um, walking boots. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people tape up their feet for long walking challenges. Um, a sort of a sort of a pre blister preventative measure. I've never been a fan of that. I think the best way is if you've got really good hiking socks with loop stitches and you want the, the ones like Bridgedale, again, not sponsored by them, blah, blah, blah. But um, the ones with loop stitches on the inside that wick the moisture away from the skin because they're really good and, they're, um, and they will prevent blisters. But also I would Vaseline your feet up in the morning. That's a really top tip. Um, and keep them Vaseline um, um, because that, that will stop blisters definitely. So good luck on your 24 hour walk. <clears throat> That's from Liam. Um, yoga with Lydia says, hi Ed. From wandering in, blah, 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 wandering into wellness, my son Ruben wants to know if you have any stories about encounters with animals when surviving outside. Um, <laughs> quite a few, actually. Um, do I tell this one? This is horrific, actually. Um, yeah, I will tell it because it's, um, it's quite full on. But um, took my little boy, who was eight months old at the time, into the jungle to see Laura when she was kayaking down the Essequibo. She'd been kayaking for about six weeks and I've got about a month left to go. And so um, she was really missing Rand because he was only eight months old and she was his mum. And so she was describing on the satellite phone how it was like a pay stabbing pain when she um, got into her hammock at night because she missed him so much. And so I decided to <laughs> um, fly into Georgetown in Guyana, charter a twin propane Cessna aircraft, fly into a grass runway in the middle of the um, Amazon, hire indigenous guides to take me up in a, in a boat up to the point on the river where um, where Laura was. I had a, a million pound uh, insurance package for my little boy and there was a helicopter company that would be able to come and get us if anything went wrong. But we thought, you know, nothing will go wrong. Um, on the way up the river, we saw a jaguar sunbathing on a rock and I thought, that's extraordinary. In two and a half years of walking the Amazon, I've never seen a jaguar, but Guyana is almost untouched in the southern areas. It's just like Disney jungle. There's monkeys everywhere. It's, it's just extraordinary. And then um, we camped. Um, I had a, um, 
It's called a tensile hammock, which goes between three trees. And I thought that would be nice and flat to sleep in with Rand because we won't roll together in a conventional hammock. But we also had a, um, had a cot, like a baby cot with a zip around top. Um, and Laura and I hadn't seen each other for, um, for <laughs> over, over a month, six weeks or so. So um, we ended up sleeping in the tensile and Rand slept on the floor in the cot, which has got a zip around um, top. So we thought he's going to be safe from snakes. He's going to be safe from... Um, from uh, mosquitoes, everything was fine. The next day, I said to Laura, we're gonna go take the motorboat down river to a little lodge, and we're gonna wait for you there, because Ran had been on the river a little bit too much. He'd had a little bit too much sun, so I wanted to protect him. The next night, so they slept without us there, and we were in a lodge, Ran and I, um, a jaguar walked straight through camp and went straight between two hammocks. Um, so just imagine, imagine if he'd walked through and our little boy was on the floor. Well, it doesn't, it's not worth imagining at all, is it? But um, something is looking after us in this world. <laughs> Why did I just say that live? Um, yeah, extraordinary, really. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that, was an, uh, that was for Ruben. That was a little story on what not to do with your eight-month-old baby. Um, uh, 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 William from Norfolk, are hammock liners outside the hammock any good? Yeah, I, I think you do find, this is a really good one for this lesson. If you're sleeping in a hammock in cold temperatures, you're going to need either a hammock liner on the outside or you're going to need to put something like a closed cell um, sleeping mat inside the liner between you and your sleeping bag. If it's a double hammock, you can slip it between the two layers and that works really well. But hammocks traditionally are for hot climates. They're perfect in hot climates because they keep you cool because of that wind that's whipping underneath you and wicking away the heat. That's what they're brilliant for. But if you're in a cold climate, they're not as good. Therefore, they do need um, insulation underneath. So closed cell therm arrest or, or, or a hammock warmer, a hammock liner, you're calling it, I think, but um, yeah. Um, our boys would like to know what's the worst thing you've eaten. <laughs> tadpoles, I think. If you think about what a tadpole is, it's a little bag of intestines which is full of shit, and so you're just eating a little bag of tangy poo, basically, um, minging. Don't eat tadpoles. Um, do, do, do. Which pack craft do you use? Alpaca, um, Google them. They're really, really good ones. Um, and they do ones now, I've not even trialed them, but they do ones now where you've got a zip in the actual hull of the pack raft and you can stuff your equipment incredibly into the inflatable part of the pack raft so you don't even have to do what I did, which was to strap my big rucksack onto the top of it. So they're, they're really good for expeditions where you want to be able to cross water bodies um, and a pack raft is packed down is only about that big. Um, so they're, they're, they're a really, really good thing. Um, do, do, do. <coughs> Morning, Ed, which trousers were, do you wear when you're out in the wild? Um, I'm not really a trouser snob. Anyone that, um, I wouldn't wear jeans, basically. Jeans just retain water and will make you freezing cold and the heavy if they get wet. Anything that dries quickly, I would say. Um, or, and it's got a bit of stretch in it, ideally, so you don't, you don't, um, Rip your trousers in the crotch like I do all the time. Do you have anything? I need to protect, get, prevent getting bitten by a snake. Maybe something to put my kneecap on. Uh, protection from snake bites. Um, you can get snake gaiters. Um, sometimes I've gone on um, filming trips where the insurance has insisted on snake gaiters being worn. I'm not a big advocate, actually. I'd prefer to wear jungle boots or, or wellies um, to protect my ankles. I think wellies are a really good one. They come up to about here, so you are going to protect yourself. Um, um, but obviously, in the, if you're in the jungle, snakes, they, they're not jumping out at you all the time. It's not like in the movies, um, but you do have to be cautious. But the best way of avoiding snakes is just to be aware all the time. You're constantly looking for movement on the ground. You're constantly being careful. Um, and um, more often than not, they will move, you'll see them, you draw back from them, and then you can just avoid them. <clears throat> uh, uh, uh. Okay, the riddler is saying that's an amazing story. I can't believe I just told that yet. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite place you've been? Argentine Patagonia, I love it. Um, amazing people, very self-deprecating. Uh, they love their sport and their rugby out there. They've got their red wine and their fantastic steaks and they've got the mountains with the ski slopes and stuff. Um, San Carlos de Bariloche, I would say, is one of the happiest, happiest times of my life and one of the loveliest places. Um, 
do 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 Jane Walkington saying God was protecting you yeah yeah uh, something up there was yeah um, where's one place you want to travel to um Antarctica has always been the one that's been evading me um I uh yeah I, I've bored you with this story before I'm sure but um I, I had an expedition planned to walk across Antarctica, didn't get funding, um, but um, if the wheels fall, fall off my life and, um, and, um, and I need to do another massive expedition, then Antarctica is something that, um, somewhere where I'd love to go. Reasonably priced walking boots, would you recommend? Um, <laughs> Scarpa are good, Lower are good, Outberg are good. Um, the thing is, all of these boots are traditional boots and they all have a chunky sole on them nowadays. I tend to go for barefoot shoes. Um, so, um, um, Viva Barefoot's the brand that I'm sponsored by. I am sponsored by them, so yeah, just, just being honest about that. Um, because I don't like, I feel like I'm on platform shoes now if I wear big chunky rubber soles. So, um, and, and my feet are actually too wide now to return to conventional shoes. Um, so I, I, um, I wear uh, their outdoor shoe uh, uh, is the well they've got a new one coming out but the 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 main outdoor shoe is called the Tracker um, which is a pretty good shoe. Um, what's the scariest encounter you've had with an animal? Well I've just said it. Uh, Kay in Japan said thanks for sharing your knowledge. I do think I do think it's best prime time program in Japan. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to think of this as a prime time show in Japan. <laughs> Sasha and Sorrel in the Isle of Man are saying hello. Hi guys. Um, what's your favourite souvenir? Um, I've not been one for collecting many things actually. When I finished with the Amazon War, I gave all my kit, which was all pretty mouldy anyway, um, to Cho, who was my walking partner. I haven't kept that much. I have got the knife that I made on Olorua. I have got some of the fire kit actually that I made on Olorua, just because getting that fire going on the 60 days on the island was was so mammoth in my head um, um, but I think in general if you spend as much time as I have outdoors using nothing and relying on nothing and just using your, your noggin and your bare hands you, you, you actually become less materialistic you, um, you, you, you don't need as many things and therefore actual property has, has slightly less value I do I try and declutter my life as much as possible not always feasible when you've got a family and kids and stuff like that is it but um, I think for me the more baggage I have the more I feel well, will feel weighed down the more the more that the more things there are to maintain I think there's a real freedom in learning this sort of knowledge so that you've got greater confidence going out in the outdoors and so you can do stuff with less um, less physical things so you haven't got a lighter yes you can make make fire by rubbing two sticks together you haven't got a shelter yes you can make a shelter that for me is freedom that that is connection to nature that is all of the things that <clears throat> that i love in life um okay i'm gonna leave it there i think ben in staffordshire is just saying hello love the light lessons thank you for doing these in lockdown absolute pleasure mate um i i really enjoy doing these they are quite a setup in the morning i was meant to get up at 6 30 this morning the alarm didn't go off and about uh, half past eight, I thought, right, crikey, I should get up and start planning this lesson. But hopefully there was some useful stuff in there. A little bit cobbled together at the last minute, but um, if you do want to sleep outside, I would advocate that. Always have a um, adult supervising you, making sure that you're going to be safe, okay? So I'm not, this isn't going out on your own and not telling a, um, an adult or responsible person where you are. But it's great because it forces you to learn new stuff and put yourself in a position where you might be slightly uncomfortable, but I think that, that is a really healthy thing to do. Thank you for tuning in guys. Um, and um, please tune in again on Monday, for, which will be Stephen's lesson. I'm not sure what he's teaching, but he's got, better wi not, he's got better cell phone reception where he is. So he's able to get out and about into the woods a little bit more than I am. Um, and so probably he'll be more mobile, but thank you very much for tuning in and I'll see you on Wednesday.